Hello, today is August 15, 2019, and we're going to be doing something a little different today. We're going to be talking about ForeFlight and how it interfaces with X-Plane 11. I've been using ForeFlight now for just a little bit over a month. Uh, let me first say as a disclaimer that I am not a ForeFlight expert. I am learning a little bit more each and every day. It seems like every time I use it, I learn something new. But hopefully I can impart some tidbits that are helpful to you if you decide to use it in X-Plane or even in a real airplane. So you may have noticed in some of my videos, I am able to project my ForeFlight image up onto the PC screen. And the way I'm able to do that uh, is a program called Lonely Screen. It is a, a paid program. You pay an annual subscription to me. It's well worth it because I'm able to see my ForeFlight displayed as I fly the airplane. And it's particularly helpful when I'm making videos. So Lonely Screen is the program, and what it does is it causes your PC to emulate a Apple device so that when you turn on your iPad, it looks for Apple devices for screen mirroring purposes. And when you swipe down, in this case, I have an iPad mini, when you swipe down and click screen mirroring, which I'm doing right now, you can't see it, but that's what I'm doing. A list comes up of devices that your iPad sees and the one that it's showing right now is Lonely Screen. And when I click on Lonely Screen, now it, it mirrors what my iPad sees onto the PC screen. So that's how I'm able to do that. So again, uh, if that's something you, you want to do, Lonely Screen is a great program for that purpose. So let's talk a little bit about uh, ForeFlight. ForeFlight has several subscription levels. It is a paid program. Um, it's, I'm always amazed by it. It seems like every time I use it, there, I find something and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And uh, so maybe even on today's flight, I'll find something new. But in any case, it's uh, particularly useful in the airplane because it gives you amazing situational awareness. I mean, as you can see, we're there on the ground at KTIW. So because it's synced up with X-Plane, it's going to uh, behave as if you're in a real airplane in every respect. So it's going to see where you are, at your altitude, the terrain below you. Um, your flight plan is, is going to be programmed in there. And so it's, it's going to behave as it does in the real airplane. And it's really helpful to use it in your simulator if you plan on doing real world flight or if you just plan on doing simulation flight. It's, a, it's an extremely useful tool, particularly the moving map feature for situational awareness purposes but for me because i use it in the real world airplane um, i'm able to train with it make mistakes learn here in the simulator so that when i get it in the airplane i'm proficient and they don't have to stumble around while while trying to control a real world airplane so let's first start by talking a little bit about how you interface with x-plane so what you do is you bring up your ipad settings screen which is right here and right here at Wi-Fi you click on that and then you click the info button right there and you can see your IP address 192.168.0.19 in this case so then you go back to ForeFlight I'm sorry we're going to go into our X-Plane and if you go to network settings right here so you're going up here to your settings and then select network. If you look down here, it's got X plane control pad. And you're going to enter in, enter in the IP address that's on your iPad here. So I put it in both places, broadcast to all mapping apps and the network transmit to a single mapping app that have that selected. Because they only have one iPad. So I put that IP address here and then use control pad as an iOS device. I put that down here as well. So 0 0.19 is entered in both places. Now, if I change this, to something other than what it really is. Let's just pick something random. We'll put five zero. And then we'll do the same thing here. And we'll say done. So now when we go to four flight, it no longer sees our airplane. It's because it's not synced up. But what it will do is it'll now transition to the GPS that's on board the iPad itself, and it will show my location in real life. 
which is right now over here at Gig Harbor. So that's where I actually am. Now when I change the IP address back to the proper IP address for X-Plane purposes, back to one niner, and do the same here. Go back to X-Plane, bring up four flight, and now it sees us at the airport. I'm going to pause this, get rid of that background noise, bring back four flight. And so that's how you interface with X-Plane. And again, as I said earlier, it interacts with X-Plane as if you're in a real airplane in all respects. All right, so let's talk about some of the features. The first thing we're going to do is decide where do we want to go today. So we're going to actually talk about uh, four flight how it interfaces with X-Plane, and then we're gonna actually put together a flight plan and fly it so that we can use for flight during the flight. It's gonna be a short flight. We're gonna take it over to Sierra 50 over here at Auburn. So we're gonna to fly to Auburn Airport. We're not gonna go directly to Auburn. We're gonna fly the Seahawk transition through Class Bravo airspace up at SeaTac. So let's put together a flight plan and we'll start by tapping on our present location at KTIW. We're just gonna tap on that airport and we're gonna say add to route. That's one way to add it to a route. So you tap on the airport, it asks you what do you wanna do? Do you wanna go directly to it? Do you wanna add it to the route? <clears throat> In this case, we added it to the route. Another way to add an airport to the route is to actually type it in. So we're going to type it in up here, and we're going to put Sierra 50 enter. So now it's got Sierra 50, which is Auburn Airport, from KTIW direct. But we're not going to fly direct. We're going to fly a couple of different waypoints, and then we're going to transition through the SeaTac airspace and then come back down to Auburn. And the way we're going to do that is let's decide what waypoint we want. So we're going to pick Cove right here. Victor, Papa, looks like Bravo Kilo Delta, Cove. So I'm gonna place my finger on that and hold it down. And then right here where it's got the lat long, I'm gonna tap on that. Now it's in our route, but it's not where we want it in our route because we're not gonna go there after Auburn. We're gonna go there before Auburn. So what we wanna do is up here, I'm gonna grab this bubble with my finger, slide it over and put it in between KTIW and S50. like so. So now it's it's arranged our waypoint appropriately. Now I want to add another waypoint. So let's let's say uh, right now they're going to be flying the Seahawk transition because I know for a fact they're using runways 16. I just listened to ATIS. So now I'm going to grab this leg. I'm going to place my finger on this leg. I'm going to grab it and I'm going to bring it up and then let my finger off. And it's like, okay, what do you want to do with that? Well, I'm going to tap on the lat long again and it's gonna put it in my flight plan, again, in the appropriate location, right there. So since we're flying the Seahawk transition today, we're gonna to come over here, and we know that the Seahawk transition, as depicted here, when runways 16 are in use, is between 1,500 and 2,500 MSL. ATC is gonna assign that when you request your clearance, and you're gonna cross the threshold of 16 center. If the winds were different and they were using runways three, four, you would be flying the Mariner transition, same altitude range assigned by ATC, but in that case, you would cross the threshold of runway three, four center. So since we know we're gonna be crossing one, six center, let's go ahead and add that as a waypoint. So again, I'm gonna grab my leg, I'm gonna drag it up to the threshold of runway one, six center, take my finger off and tap that. So now that's added to our route. So now after we cross one six center, we're gonna to wanna to follow the transition outbound. So I'm again, I'm gonna grab my leg, pull it up to that point, let my finger off, tap on the lat long, and now that's added. So that's gonna be our flight today. So we're cove, then we're gonna to fly to the beginning of the transition, 
cross runway 16 center at whatever altitude we're assigned by ATC outbound to this waypoint here and by then we should be cleared out of the Bravo and then we'll make our descent into Auburn. Let's look at a few other features before we move on. One thing I want to point out is this right here allows you to take that flight plan that we just put in here and then I'm going to click on flights and it brings up the current flight plan into the flights screen and I can actually file from here an FAA flight, uh, flight plan either IFR or VFR. We're not going to do that obviously but and the other feature is and again this depends on your subscription level but based on the current barometric pressure and the current temperature and your current altitude and the altitude of the airport that you're going to be flying to it'll give you your takeoff and landing distance. Now that becomes really important when you're flying at a very high density altitude such as let's say you're flying Flagstaff Arizona at Pulliam Airport which is at 7,000 and it's uh, a warm day there say it's 90 degrees. Well your density altitude may not allow you to even take off from that airport based on your ground roll and in which case you're going to get a red flag and it's going to tell you that you don't have sufficient runway length for takeoff or landing uh, if, if again you're at too high of a density altitude. But in this case if we scroll down here it's based on one passenger at 175 pounds uh, that would be me and then the fuel it's going to assume the minimum fuel needed for this flight that we just put into the flight plan uh, plus reserve. So I can even change this by hitting max. So I'm going to hit max and now it's maximum fuel which is 50 gallons which is 300 pounds and then it recalculates our takeoff and landing distances based on uh, the fuel that we have on board and me on board and then no, no cargo. So because I have zero cargo right here. However, it will also calculate how much fuel you're going to burn in route, how much fuel you'll have by the time you land based on winds aloft, your, your estimated speed over ground, and, and this is based on current weather conditions. If I had a different departure time set into my flight plan, it would look at the terminal area forecast, the forecasted winds aloft, and then it would, might make some changes depending on the conditions then versus now on your takeoff and landing distances based on fuel usage and the barometric pressure and the temperature that's projected at that time of day. So if we go up here to take off and landing, let's just click take off. It's going to ask us to pick a runway. It's going to show us what runway it recommends based on the wind direction, in this case runway 17. So I'm going to select runway 17 and then I'm going to go back up. Well, it's going to give us the usable length of the runway, which is 5,002 feet at KTIW. And then it's going to give us our ground roll so we know how many feet that we get need for our takeoff, which is going to be depicted here. A total uh, distance of 1,522 1, feet, again, based on current conditions. So now if we scroll back up and we go back here and then we click on landing, it's going to give us our landing distance based on, let's pick a runway. It's not recommending a particular runway. I'm going to estimate that it's probably going to be 1.6 in use. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And then it gives us our takeoff roll for landing. And it's going to say you need 1,075 feet to land. Again, that come, becomes really important if you're flying into small airports based on the density altitude uh, conditions. It'll let you know, hey, you either do or don't have enough runway to use. So that's a really cool feature in ForeFlight. Again, that's going to depend on your subscription level. Anytime you want to go backwards, you click right here. So uh, I can also take this. It's not filed, and I'm not obviously going to file it. But if I were going to file a flight plan, I can then also go into the briefing. And from my departure to destination airports, it'll give me a full weather briefing with terminal area forecast, with uh, temporary flight restrictions, everything I need to know for my departure to destination airports will be uh, in that briefing. So we're not gonna file, obviously. Let's go back. I'm gonna go back to maps right here. So let's click on maps. And I'll show you another feature here, moving left to right, and this is plates. So if I click plates, uh, let's say I wanna add a plate of some kind. So I'm going to click that and it knows what airports I've got in my flight plan. So I have KTIW and S50. So let's click on S50 and it's going to say, what plate do you want to add to your plate screen? And I'm going to say, okay, I want the airport diagram for sure. 
and let's say I'm on an IFR flight. We're not going to do that today, but let's say we're on an IFR flight, and I'm planning on landing in the RNAV alpha approach. So let's add that plate to our plates. So now I have these plates that I can quick reference by going to the plate screen, clicking on it, and then it brings up, in this case, the airport diagram. So another thing that I can do is if I want to make notes on here, I can click this and I can say, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be when I land. I want to park right here. So I can go ahead and draw a line. To that location. And, and I can save that so that when I taxi off, whichever taxiway I taxi off, I know that that's where I, I want to be. And it'll save that. And then again, I can superimpose this. So I'm going to say done. I'm going to keep that just for now. Close this. And I'm going to go back to maps. Again, I'm going to click on maps. I'm going to click up here on Sierra 50. And I'm going to say show plate. And it's going to show that plate superimposed over my VFR sectional airport diagram. So now when I land, whichever taxiway I get off, I know, oh, okay, that's that's where I want to go. If this was a really complex airport, this would certainly come in handy. Auburn looks pretty straightforward. It wouldn't be an issue. But So that's really cool. And again, this is to scale, and it's superimposed over your VFR sectional. To get rid of that, you just click on the gear up here, and then we're going to say hide plate. We're going to click hide plate right there. So that gets rid of it. And back over to KTIW. So uh, another cool feature is you see this 3D right here. It's going to take our flight plan that we have in here right now, and it's given us it'll give us a 3D movie of the actual terrain that we're going to be following on this plan, so that we can preview the flight before we fly it. So right now I have it set for 20x. I click on the play button, and it's going to play that entire flight. So we're heading northbound to Vashon Island. This is going to be our first waypoint, which is Cove right here, this magenta. As soon as it hits that, we're going to make our right turn to the beginning of the Seahawk transition. And you can take and move your point of view around, and it resets the point of view after a certain amount of seconds to your direction of flight. So now we've passed Cove, and we're heading over SeaTac right now, over 1-6 Center. And as soon as we hit 1-6 Center, depict it right here, the magenta, It'll transition to the next leg, also highlighted in magenta, and then our approach into Auburn. So that could come in really handy if you're unfamiliar with a particular flight that you're taking. You want to see the terrain. It may be of particular importance to you. So I'm going to close this out right now uh, if, if it's mountainous terrain and, and you want to see what that's going to look like on your flight path. Also, when you complete a flight, it'll allow you to do the same thing. Once it's saved to your flight log, you can go in there and review your flight. Instead of preview it, you'll be able to see where you actually flew. So that's, again, another really cool feature. Scratch pads, I'm going to go over that really quick right here. It allows you, let's, uh, let's pick a scratch pad. We're going to add one. Um, craft. That's a good one. So if you're on an IFR flight, let's say to I'm riding on the Sugar 50, they're going to give you your your route, your altitude, your frequency, and your transponder squat code. And then it'll save that. When you close it, it'll save it. And you can go back to that scratch pad page, bring this up, and you'll see all the information. So you can either do it on paper or you can do it on here. That'll that'll save right there. And then I can click on clear up top, clear scratch pad if I want to and clear it. It's also got one for ATIS information that you can put put your notes into or just a blank page if you have any notes that you want to add. That's uh, also a pretty cool feature. So I'm going over here to more. And this is where you, you keep your logbook. Now, this is actual, uh, let's see, all... This is all the uh, real world, you know, uh, real world flights that I've taken, and it also has your four flight flights in there. When you do those, I don't add those to my log, but you know that is an option. This is the airplane we're going to be flying, and as I said, when we talked a little bit about the the flight plan and the takeoff and landing uh, distances, those are based on your actual airplane performance. Now those are programmed into four flight. Depending on your subscription level, one subscription level offers 
uh, a database of a couple of hundred different aircraft and it's got their performance data in a database and when you select that airplane then it translate transfers all that information into your profile and it uses that to do those calculations that we talked about fuel usage landing and takeoff distances etc including weight and balance in this case so here uh, i have a pilot and co-pilot and their weights and one passenger um, and the baggage area has 20 pounds so it's going to look at the performance the uh, center of gravity envelope of your airplane and it's going to tell you whether you're in or out of the uh, safe tolerances for that for that cg so let's change for example i'm going to go ahead and change the co-pilot uh, add weight to him make him also a 230 pounder and it may tell us so i'm done and we're going to save that see now you're overweight so it gave us a warning and it's going to tell you you're overweight for takeoff you're overweight for landing your takeoff weight is too high and so you know that you cannot make this flight with these passengers on board so let's go ahead and take this passenger say we're, we don't we don't have a passenger and now we're just on the edge of the cg envelope for this flight with a 230 pound pilot and co-pilot and no passengers with 20 pounds of, of uh, baggage so that's again a really a very important feature in, in real world flying so so again that's the the airplane profile that we're flying today um, i've got all my aircraft in here that i fly you know either real world or in flight simulator and all the performance data is is also in this database so it'll change all the performances based on my flight and what airplane i'm flying so uh, track logs this is where your track logs are going to come up for the, the flights that you fly you can bring them up you can uh, review the profile you can replay that flight in 3d right here so that's one that i did uh, that's actually the one we're going to fly today that's one that i did in the past so that would be and i can speed up the timeline to get me off the ground and into the flight more quickly so again that's one I actually flew the one we looked at a little bit ago is one that we previewed that we entered into the flight plan so we should be coming over Vashon Island here making our right turn out beginning of the transition there's Seattle Tacoma Airport lining up with runway 16 center threshold and then we're going to turn right and uh, transition out of the class Bravo, make our approach down into Auburn Airport. So that's the one we're gonna be flying today. And as we fly, we're gonna be talking about some of the other features in flight. And this is coming in for the landing. There's Auburn and on the ground. All right, so I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna go back. In the devices page, it shows that you're connected to X-Plane, you're successfully connected. We already knew that because we saw our position on the ground when we looked at our airport map. Um, if you were in the airplane and had a real airplane and had the ADSB receiver, it would show that you're connected to that. Everything's being done by Wi-Fi. So let's go back to maps. And let's say we're flying along and we want to divert to another airport port or are we lose an engine or for some other purpose we want to land if you hold press and hold your finger anywhere on this map it's going to bring up the nearest airports to wherever you pressed your finger on the map in this case uh whiskey alpha 69 right here is the nearest and if i said click click more and wanted to add that to the route it's going to add it to the route at the end of the route um in this case because we already had a route in here let's go ahead and remove whiskey alpha 69 so i'm going to click on it remove it from the route let's say i'm flying along and i want to go direct to whiskey alpha 69 then i would click here press more i'm not going to do this because it'll wipe out my whole flight plan and then i would click direct to and then it would give me uh, a direct leg from wherever i am on this map to that airport it'll give the distance and all the information they're going to need including the frequencies if there are any this is a private airport so it wouldn't have any but all that information is going to be right there at my fingertips so that is a useful tool in emergency situations um, so there's our flight plan right there 
we reviewed it in 3D. This other thing I want to talk a little bit about, this little suitcase, if you click on this, it tells you, hey, this is the stuff you're going to need to complete this flight. This is the important information within this perimeter that you're going to need, including um, significant meteorological reports, temporary flight restrictions, this is less important, but fuel prices, notices to airmen at the airport, and then 3D view aerial imagery. And then if you click pack, it'll upload all that stuff to your iPad. And by the way, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but ForeFlight does require an iPad. It doesn't work on a Android type device. It has to be an iPad. So it is what it is. So you would have to decide what size iPad works best for you. In my case, I like the iPad mini because it mounts inside the cockpit without interfering with instruments and that sort of thing. this and one other thing I want to point out is so let's say I'm unfamiliar with Auburn never been there I want to see what that looks like from the air so I'm going to click on this bubble with the Sierra 50 and I'm going to show 3d right there I'm going to click on that so now it's going to bring up a three-dimensional view of the airport as seen uh, in this case it looks like 6218 feet it gives me the airport elevation and I can rotate around depending which direction that I'm approaching the airport uh, and see what it looks like from, from different directions. I can zoom out. So again, that can be really helpful if you're flying into an unfamiliar airport, particularly if there's mountainous terrain, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out. All right. So that's just kind of in a nutshell overview of how to interface with X-Plane, what it does when you interface with it, how to put together a flight plan, how to send that flight plan over to where you could actually file and get a weather briefing. If, if you want a briefing or a full briefing, not just weather, from departure to destination, that's, that's where you would do it. Okay, so we're going to go back to maps. So I've already started the airplane. I've gone through my uh, my run up. Uh, I've listened to ATIS. We'll listen to ATIS again because it may have changed just during this brief period that we've been kind of narrating. We're going to be using Pilot Edge today, so I'll be contacting them. I'll be simulating the air traffic control communications here on the ground and with Tower uh, because Pilot Edge doesn't cover this airport. But I will be contacting uh, ATC up here to to request uh, clearance for this transition. And then we'll fly into Auburn, which is uh, um, non-towered, and we'll, we'll tune to the CTAF frequency and, and make our calls to traffic as we approach it. All right, so that's a quick overview. Again, we're going to be going over some of the other features of ForeFlight as we fly. And this is just scratching the surface. All right, so back inside the airplane, as you can see, engines running. We've done our run-up. Already listened to ATIS, and we just need to get our takeoff clearance, and we'll be on our way. So let's bring up ForeFlight, just take a look once again at what we're going to be doing here. So we're taking off runway 17, so we're going to be southbound. And we need to activate this leg. There we go. So we're going to fly southbound, and then we're going to make a left turn out, fly the downwind for runway 17, and then we're going to join our course, which I'm going to tap on that. It looks like it's going to be about 359. 359. We'll know better once we get to that leg what heading we need to make. Okay, so that's the plan. Let's go ahead and turn off four flight for now and get our takeoff clearance. <clears throat> Tacoma Tower, Cherokee 7428 Romeo is holding short runway 17, ready for departure. Cherokee 7428 Romeo, Tacoma Tower, wind slight variable runway 17, clear for takeoff, north departure approved. Clear for takeoff, north departure approved, Cherokee 7428 Romeo. Approaching runway 17. Entered runway 17. 4,900 feet remaining. There again, and I'll bring up four flight just so you can see that, uh, is a great feature. It tells you when you've entered the runway, how much runway you have left.
And once you're synced up through, again, if, if you use the screen, screen mirroring program, Lonely Screen that, that I'm using, it will you will get your audio through your headset. All right, let's turn on four flight for now. And full power. Seven six seven American twenty one oh six. Right, twenty one zero six, you're not correct.
so I typically size this window, this screen mirroring window, just so that it barely fits inside of our pop-up. So it doesn't take too much of our screen. Now the other thing CoreFlight does in uh, the real world that I have when, when I have the ADSB receiver attached inside the airplane is all the traffic within proximity of Sky 96 code. of my airplane is displayed. And it'll give you traffic alerts if the traffic is within a really close Sky proximity. Sky 96, okay, and expect that. You'll get a red flag, kind of a warning. It'll tell you how far and what, at what altitude, either plus or minus from your present altitude. All right, Charlie, I'm going to report port site. In Seattle, good afternoon, Delta. We have information, Kilo Taxi 16 left. And that's it, standby. Delta 213, Seattle, runway 16 left, back to via Bravo. We'll take Bravo to runway 16 left, Delta 13. Charlie, Romeo, Roger. All right, Charlie, Romeo, contact Boise Tower, 118.1. Boise Tower, 648, Romeo, 4,400 descending, uh, inbound. Six for a Charlie Romeo, big uh, correction, Boise Tower, and a left base, left base, runway two eight right, clear to land, wind two six zero eight. Left base for two eight right, uh, six for a Charlie Romeo. Right, Charlie Romeo, runway two eight right, clear to land. Two eight right, clear to land, hey, Charlie Romeo. Seattle Tower, Cherokee seven four two eight Romeo, VFR request. Cherokee 428 Romeo, Seattle Tower, Squawk 3746, say request. Sem428 Romeo is type Piper Cherokee, 8 miles to the west, 2500 with information Zulu, requesting the Seahawk transition west to east. Sky 7, four, correction, Cherokee 7428 Romeo, radar contact, position out to check, clear to the Seattle Bravo airspace via Seahawk route, and maintain VFR 1500, out to 3024. Maintain VFR 2500, clear through Bravo via the Seahawk transition, 7428 Romeo. Sky High 96, Battleground VOR at 8000, clear to ILS from a 2 2 approach, McMinnville. So, there because I said information Zulu, he knew I had custom weather, otherwise, he would not have cleared me. See the airport straight ahead. Sky 
so on the initial radio co uh, co contact, you, you saw that he gave us the squawk code right away before he even asked us what we want. Because they, they definitely like you to have a discrete squawk code while they're communicating with you. They don't always do it, but when they do, it differenti differentiates you and identifies you specifically from all other air, air traffic. Threshold, 1-6. And once we cross that, we're going to make a right turn out. Now, if you tap on the next leg, it tells you what magnetic heading you'll be flying. So we're anticipating 129 degrees as soon as we cross that threshold. Seattle Tower, Delta 213, we're ready to go around runway 16 left. Delta 213, Seattle Tower, wind calm, runway 16 left, clear for takeoff. 16 left, we are clear for takeoff, Delta 213. Delta 213, Seattle departure at our contact. Climb and maintain 15,000. So if we did lose an engine, it's Wait, Charlie Romeo's here. Clearly SeaTac. Oh, uh, general right. aviation on the north side. All right, Charlie Romeo attack into the ramp on Alpha monitor ground point seven. Alpha ground point seven, Charlie Romeo. All right, Charlie Romeo is near the Bravo airspace. Better services terminated. Squawk and maintain VFR frequency change approved. Squawking VFR, frequency change approved, 742 Air Romeo, thanks a lot.
right, so we're going to flip over to CTAF, and we're going to begin our descent. And we're going to go through our pre-landing checklist, fuel pump on, landing light on, car beat on. And there's Auburn Airport straight ahead. Auburn traffic, Cherokee 7428 Romeo is six miles to the north, inbound, landing runway 16, Auburn traffic. Glide slope looks good. Okay, engine instruments in the green. Pre-landing checklist complete. Hundred. So that's four flight telling us we have 500 feet. AGL, there. One mile final runway 16. Auburn traffic, Cherokee 7428 Romeo is on one mile final for runway 16, Auburn traffic. So you can bring the airspeed up a little bit. So these power lines that you see are not there in real life. Be foolish to have power lines in your, in your flight path. And we're pitching for airspeed and power for sync rate. And landing is assured, final notch of flaps. threshold power back and transitioning to slow flight over the runway. I'm just going to keep that nose up, keeping that nose off, keeping it off, and there's the mains. Flaps retracted, car beat off, and we'll turn out right here. Clean up the airplane, park and do a debrief. Auburn traffic, Cherokee 7428 Romeo is clear of the runway. Auburn traffic. All right. Fuel pump off, landing light off. Mixture lean for taxi, car heat is off. And flaps are retracted. <clears throat> clear left, clear right. We'll park right next to that 172 there. 
Get it shut down. So radios off, transponder off, avionics master off, and coming right to left. All switches off. Master switch off, idle cutoff, and ignition switch off, parking brake on. And that's done. Let's go ahead and bring up for flight and take a look at our flight path. So, what ForeFlight does, and I'm not sure if I talked about this earlier, but up here in settings, once again, we scroll to the bottom, and this breadcrumbs feature right here, as you see, is turned on, and that's what it does. It, it tracks your entire flight and leaves green breadcrumbs, if you will, and that's our flight path. And we'll see how that compares to four flights map. It should be precisely the same. So there it is in four flight, which again precisely matches what we're seeing here. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the flight path in X plane, which matches what we see here in four flight. So we talked about a lot of features, certainly not all the features of four flight. It uh, it has a lot more, it does a lot more. This was intended to be a fully in-depth video. It would probably be way too long to begin with. Uh, plus, I'm still learning a lot of the features that it has. Uh, one thing I will point out, so say you're kind of zeroed in here on your, and again, that's the, that's the taxi diagram that we drew earlier. Uh, and that's where we are. We, we ended up right there at the end of that. So uh, if, if you are flying along and you're kind of centered in on your airplane and you want to bring up your entire flight plan, just click on this button right here and it reorients the map to include your entire flight plan. If you want the map to center on your aircraft as you're flying, you click this button up here and there it centers to, to where your airplane is. If you want the map to orient to your direction of flight as opposed to north, which I had it set to orient north, you would simply click here and then it orients you to the direction that you're pointing. Now, I, one thing I want to say in, in the reason that, uh, you know, I have the, the um, logo that says keep it real at the very beginning of all of my videos is because that that's my approach to flight simulation is to keep it as real as possible there are times when you deviate from that and do some fun stuff that you wouldn't do in, in real flight but that's important to me because back in 2001 as a student pilot when i was on my way from pineville municipal airport that's two lima zero to lafayette i believe that's kilo lima fox tango uh, it's around, I want to say, 70 nautical miles. I was on my way as a student pilot to take my private pilot flight test. And needless to say, anxious to get there. Uh, I kind of had what they call get there-itis. So I checked the weather there, checked the weather at, at Pineville, and uh, everything was looking good. But what I failed to do is to do, do a detailed analysis of my in-route weather. So I took off out of Pineville, and not long after that, within a matter of minutes, I saw a cloud formation in front of me, and I thought, yeah, I can just punch through that and come out on the other side, and everything would be good, which uh, you, you shouldn't do in VFR flight. If you see IMC conditions, clouds, you, you need to remain clear of them, depending on what airspace you're in. Uh, the airspace that I was flying in at the time was uh, Echo, so I needed to maintain 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet laterally, and I had to have at least three miles visibility. So um, I did, did not have that clearance. I was obviously flying toward this cloud formation, so I was closer than 2,000 feet, went into it, and unbeknownst to me, there was no coming out on the other side. I stayed in that condition for 20 minutes, zero visibility, instrument meter, logical conditions, and I liken it to 
uh, someone throwing a sheet over the top of your airplane. Everything is white. All you have then is your instruments to stay alive. And what I had done up to that point prior to taking my private pilot uh, flight lessons is I flew a simulator. I flew Microsoft Flight Simulator 98. And Flight Simulator 98 has included in it some tutorials where you can earn certificates for private pilot and you can earn a certificate for instrument, uh, your instrument rating. I did both of those. I earned, I earned those certificates and uh, it, they're really well-designed courses narrated by Rod Machado. And um, I can say I probably flew uh, at least 100 hours of s solely instrument reference, flying airways, approaches, departures, all of the things that were built into Flight Simulator 98. It's been a long time, so I don't remember all of what was involved, but it was very, very comprehensive. I earned the certificate there, and that flight simulator experience inspired me to begin my flight lessons and become a real pilot. If I had not taken that course and flown that many instrument flight hours in the simulator, I probably would not have survived that flight to Lafayette, Louisiana that day. But because I did that course, I took a deep breath. I was nervous, don't get me wrong. Real IMC is not the same as IMC in a simulator, but I had the experience of flying solely by instrument. And so I took that deep breath. I, I looked at my instruments. The airplane was straight and level. I descended to the minimum, maximum elevation figure depicted on my, uh, my VFR sectional to, in hopes that it would get me out of the IMC. It did not. So I continued the flight until I came out on the other side of that. Again, I said it was close to 20 minutes. And then I continued on my flight down, down to Lafayette. I was so rattled by that experience when I was approaching Lafayette that they gave me a landing clearance and I started to fly to the uh, to the opposite runway. And uh, so the controller said, uh, I, I can't remember what my call sign was, but whatever it was, he said, it appears you're, it appears you're entering a, a right base for whatever the runway was at the time. So I acknowledged that and, and made my turn and landed on the correct runway. But getting rattled like that clouds your, your thinking and your ability to properly communicate with ATC. I brought it in for landing. I took my private pilot uh, flight test, passed it, flew back to uh, Pineville Municipal, and it was VFR the whole way. But that experience was uh, a significant one. And the, what the way that translates for me is every time I fly the simulator, 99% of the time, there's a couple of times in there when I do some fun stuff that I wouldn't do in real flight. But 99% of the time, I fly it by, it as, make it as realistic as I can. And the cool thing about being able to bring up for flight in the simulator and train with it in this airplane is it behaves exactly the same way it's going to behave in the real airplane. And so I can do all my training, make all my mistakes, learn all the things that I can possibly learn here in the simulator environment so that I become proficient in it inside the cockpit. Thanks for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. <music>